I think I can go home now, right? <laughs> um, I want to thank you. Gosh, Caroline, <laughs> you blew me away. Um, wow. First of all, I want to thank Sue Ellen. Where are you? There you are. Don't go yet. Don't go yet. I want to thank Sue Ellen because I've been talking to universities around the country and we've been talking a lot about the new generation are the generations of makers. And the reason why I want to point out Sue Ellen is because she has made this. We are here because somebody had an idea and then she made it. Uh, when my kid was little, and he's very big now, he's over there, he's 19. I remember uh, in preschool at this very fancy uh, boys' school that Sam went to, the kids were always knocking things down, these blocks and Legos, and I remember turning to him in my you know, philosophical mode and saying, you know, Sam, it's easy to break things. It's hard to make things. <laughs> so form a team and make things. And you know what? All the volunteers here, all the organizers, we are here together to make things. And I want to thank you because readers make a brand new world. So thank you for coming today. I don't know if Dawn is here. Is Dawn here? Dawn Brosh? I'm not sure if she's here. She's somewhere here. But I wanted to thank the Bunches of Great Bookstore for having us because I write these sort of weird books about Koreans. <laughs> like, for the most part, I've actually had Koreans tell me, who wants to know about the Koreans? And I'm like, I don't know. But I know that I wouldn't have a career unless independent bookstores were behind my books. And Steve Fisher is here, who's ahead of the New England Independent Booksellers Association. And if we're going to make things, we have to be fiercely independent. So I hope that you will support independent bookstores. And finally, I think I should explain something about Caroline. Everybody's been asking me, how in the world do you know Caroline Kennedy? <laughs> and underneath that question is, she's incredibly brilliant. She is an international statesman. She's an amazing author. And she's really super literary. And she knows a lot about poetry. How in the world do you know Caroline Kennedy? And I just tell them it's very simple. I am not a snob. <laughs> I will not hold all of her achievements against her. <laughs> um, I am so very, very fortunate. Thank you so much, Caroline. It means the world to me. And I'm really so happy to be here because I wrote part of my first book in Martha's Vineyard. And I don't think, is Kitty here? Is Kitty here? Oh, it's okay. Um, I wrote part of my first book here, but before I talk about anything, I just sort of wanted to explain something about the contemporary mood, because I've been feeling really um, upset, and I thought maybe you might be feeling upset, and I thought that, you know, catharsis is a good thing. And just recently, uh, the current president had mentioned something about getting rid of legal immigrants cutting that uh, immigration law by half. And I just wanted you to know that if that law passed in 1976, when I came to America, I would not have been able to come. My mother is actually the brother of somebody who lived in this country. And because my parents, because my mother was the sibling of somebody, we were allowed to come in 1976, and I'm standing here primarily because of generous immigration laws. And it's been very troubling to me, and you'll see why I've been affected by this. So in 1989, I was a junior in college, and I was profoundly lost. I know it's hard to believe, <laughs> but I was. And I was a history major, and anybody who knows that history majors are so directed in their path for their careers. <laughs> and I had no idea what to do with my life. So instead of going to my class, I went to a lecture um, which featured an American missionary because I really had nothing better to do. And 
I did it as a favor to the university chaplain because I was the only kid, I think, at Yale College who went to church. And he said, why don't you come to this lecture? So I said, okay. And I was the only kid at this lecture, so I couldn't leave. It was me, <laughs> the university chaplain. Mind you, I'm a very obedient, compliant person. So, <laughs> and then you also had the speaker, the American missionary, this really nice white guy from America who had dedicated to serving the poor Koreans in Japan. So I figured that's a big plate of cookies. I am easily mollified by carbohydrates. <laughs> so I just sat there thinking, it's 45 minutes, what can go wrong? Well, that talk changed my life because I've spent almost over 20 years working just on this book and about 30 years ruminating about the condition of the Koreans in Japan. So. The man, the missionary, he was a nice guy and he was telling us a story about from 1910 to 1945, the Koreans in Japan came to Japan because Japan colonized Korea. And when they were colonizing Korea, many Koreans were brought in forcibly and some of them came voluntarily as economic migrants. They were just poor immigrants. And they were doing jobs that nobody wanted to do in Japan. And they stayed, and they stayed for multiple reasons, the Korean War, the division of the country, lots of reasons. However, during that time, they were really considered second-class citizens, and unfortunately, even today, Koreans in Japan really suffer under a suspicion of being very sketchy people. They're considered to be criminal, dirty, um, untrustworthy, and very often um, have poor hygiene. Even today. I took a shower today. <laughs> but um, all this was happening. And as I was hearing this from the missionary, I thought, well, that's kind of sad. But, you know, I was a history major, so I knew everything. And I figured, you know, this is another sad story. But then he told us a story about a boy that, who was in his parish who was 13 years old. And the little boy, who was in middle school, who had just graduated middle school, climbed up to the apartment building where he lived, and he jumped off to his death. And his parents were naturally devastated because they could not understand what would compel a 13-year-old boy to wish to die. So they went through his things, and they found his middle school yearbook. And in his middle school yearbook, they opened it up. His Japanese classmates had written, go back to where you belong. I hate you. You smell like kimchi. And they wrote the words, die, die, die. And that story changed my life. And I'll tell you why it changed my life. It changed my life because I'm an American citizen and I'm a naturalized American citizen. English is not my first language. And throughout my life, Had it not been for the kindness of strangers, had it not been for teachers who believed in me, I would not be here. And it shocked me to think that unlike in America, despite the headlines today, that people could hate children because of their ethnic heritage. So. I tucked that story into my heart, and I could not let it go. However, in 1990, I was still a nice immigrant girl, and I went to law school. <laughs> Caroline, you too are a nice immigrant girl. <laughs> she went to law school. <laughs> and I um, went to law school, and I practiced for two years being a corporate lawyer, and I was really good because I'm very good at doing homework. And I was like a due diligence queen. Like I was the kind of kid that you want on your deal because I would read every document. <laughs> and I would come back and say, oh, I found this little problem with the contract, you know, like you have to fix it and we'll save our clients $15,000. And I would get a pat on the head and more boxes. <laughs> and what happened was that I had a liver disease that I had had since I was 16. And my doctors were saying that I was really sick. And I'm OK now. I'm OK now. So please do not be alarmed. But they said that I would get cancer in my early 20s. And I thought to myself, well, how do I want to spend my life? And I thought that I would write a book, because it's so easy to write books. <laughs> so my husband, who's here, um, we had $15,000 saved. And I thought, that'll last me a really long time. 
and I'm going to write that book and I'm going to sell that book and then I'm going to become famous <laughs> and rich. And that didn't happen. <laughs> um, I, it took me 12 years to publish my first book. Um, from 1995 to 1996, I wrote a book, and it was sent out, and it was called The Revival of the Senses, and you will never see that book, despite the incredibly pretentious title. It was a terrible book, and it was terrible because, as my husband said, it was boring. <laughs> I love you, Chris. <laughs> I can respond in love. <laughs> and... Then in 1996 to 2003, I thought, I'm going to write about the Koreans in Japan because that is an important story, so I should focus my time on doing things that are important if I've given up money and status and security. So I focused on that book, and I wrote it, and I did all the research. Like I know everything about the Koreans in Japan. Like You can ask me anything. <laughs> and I wrote that book, and again, it was terrible because it wasn't a novel. Like, it didn't have these characters that we needed for, to make you want to pay $27 or turn the pages, more importantly, to turn the pages. So I studied a lot more about what I wanted to do, and I put that book aside. And one day, I was on the subway, which is my primary mode of transportation, and I was reading, because it's a great way to pass the time in the subway. And I finished this book by V.S. Naipaul, who is confirmedly a racist, sexist dog. However, he wrote a very beautiful, beautiful, like compelling novel called The House for Mr. Biswas. And when I finished it, I burst into tears, and you know I have a crying problem. <laughs> and people are staring at me. And when I finished it, I realized that I was really upset. I was really upset because he had had the courage to write about people that he grew up with. And I thought, oh, I'm going to do that. So then I wrote Free Food for Millionaires. So from 1997 until, uh, go golly, this is so embarrassing. So from 2003 to 2007, I wrote Free Food for Millionaires. And that book became my first book. But my first book is actually my third book. And then in 2007, my husband got this really good job. And then we needed the money. So we moved to Japan, but I didn't want to move to Japan. And then also, I didn't want to get a new husband. <laughs> because for you out there who are married, you know, it's not easy to find a good spouse. <laughs> and I didn't have any other takers. <laughs> so I, you know, I said, OK, I'll go. And I'll try to be a decent parent and a decent spouse. But my consolation was that I could return to the book about the Koreans in Japan. And I did. And I interviewed every Korean Japanese person that I could possibly meet. And I met dozens upon dozens. And once you get the flag, they usually kind of send you out to another person who you could talk to. So the initial parts were really hard because today there are three different kinds of Koreans in Japan. You c and I'm talking about fourth, fifth generation Korean Japanese people. You could be somebody who carries a South Korean passport. You don't speak Korean, you've never been to South Korea, but you can have a South Korean passport because you are a foreigner. You're five generations in and you're still a foreigner. The second kind of Korean in Japan, and this is really a doozy, is that you can identify with North Korea. And you can ask Caroline, North Korea and Japan do not have a diplomatic relationship. And consequently, you can't travel. So you actually have to walk around with a card. I've seen this card. You can't actually leave Japan and come back easily. The third kind of Korean in Japan is a person who has become a naturalized citizen, like me. I, I'm a naturalized American citizen. I wasn't born here. However, I have an American passport and all the rights and privileges of paying US taxes. Um, which I learned when I was living abroad. But anyway, I was so shocked by this group, these, these three different people, peoples, because it is only in the land of Japan where these people exist. Nowhere else in the world will you find three different kinds of Koreans who have been there for five generations. And that really sort of just broke my mind open. And the more I interviewed and the more I researched and I went to all these open markets and I spoke to all these old ladies who, sp who sold Korean food, even today in the stalls, 
what I learned was that the reason why my second book that I had written was so terrible is not because it was inaccurate. In fact, it was very accurate. It was really terrible because I had missed the point, and the Koreans and Japans told me how I had missed the point. They told me that they did not see themselves in any way as victims. They, saw, they did not see themselves as an oppressed minority. They saw themselves as people who accepted whatever history handed them, and yet they persisted, they adapted, and they kept on going. And I realized that that was something that was really important for me because I had wanted to give up so many times because I felt like, what is the point? Who cares? And this is the only book written in English about the Koreans in Japan in the world. And when I knew that that was true, that this is the only book ever written originally in English about a, a novel about the Koreans in Japan, I wasn't thinking, oh, I'm so smart. I was thinking it's because nobody wanted it. And I think this goes back to this whole idea of making things, is that before you make something, you have to believe that somebody wants the thing that you want to make. And I think that I had suffered for about, for most of my life thinking nobody wanted this thing. So I, I gotta tell you, this I didn't expect. And I'm just really so grateful to you for coming here. Lastly, um, I want to tell you why this book is called Pachinko. It's called Pachinko because, um, and for those of you who don't know, Pachinko is an adult gambling pinball game. And if any of you go to Japan, you can't really pass by any street corner without seeing these really loud, raucous arcades for adults, they're not for children. And it is a $203 billion industry. That is twice the export revenues of the, of the Japanese auto industry. And apparently they make pretty good cars. So <laughs> twice the export revenues. And that is a, a reducing number because it used to be much, much higher. And because people play less pachinko, it's only $203 billion. So as you can imagine, it is a cornerstone of the third world's largest economy. And it is an industry that is dominated by the Koreans in Japan, and it is dominated by the Koreans in Japan because the Koreans in Japan were not allowed to have regular jobs. Even today, you can be a fifth generation Korean in Japan, and if you don't have the right passport, it is very difficult for you to become a police officer, a nurse, a teacher. So you can't aspire to the middle class because you're not welcome. And consequently, the Koreans in Japan have entered two industries, pachinko and yakiniku, which is Korean barbecue. Now, for those of us here, we open-minded Americans, we probably think if you have a cousin who works um, at the card table in Las Vegas, you wouldn't necessarily think that he's a loser. And you certainly wouldn't think that his children are morally suspect, but that isn't true. Anybody who works in the industry of pachinko is considered morally suspect and considered to the mob and tied to North Korea and almost directly supporting the nuclear industry, which is absolutely not true. Unfortunately, this is what's going on. And the reason why, and I'm not doing any spoilers here, I just wanted to sort of share with you the metaphor of pachinko, which is that even when we play games, or even when things seem incredibly unfair, for me, the lessons that I learned from the Koreans in Japan were that we continue to play on. And I don't know if I should say this now, but I might as well. I've been very disappointed with what's been going on since last November. <laughs> And I know there are sometimes you want to just like lay down on the sofa yeah. and despair rather than just being amused by the revolving doors of people coming in and going out who are even less qualified than the one before. And nevertheless, I think that what we can say is that we must persist, that we must carry on, and we must create change, and we must do this for our children, and we must become makers. So thank you. Okay.
I hear from you? <laughs> Do you have any questions? I think it's this gentleman in the black shirt. Uh, thank you. Um, <laughs> love the book. Oh, thank My you. My wife and I both read it. Oh, thank we you. We live in Japan as well. Oh. Um, simple question, but spans a long period of time. How did you decide where to begin it and where to end? Oh, what's your name? My name's Mike Kurinder. Mike? Yeah. Yeah. So Mike's question's really good because uh, you're going to realize how stupid I am. <laughs> and I might as well just share. So I had no intentions of writing a historical novel. Nobody ever believes me when I say this, but I could prove it because a section of this book was published in 2002 from my pre-book, and it's a fingerprinting section, and it was intentionally supposed to be a book about 10 years. My first novel was 560 published pages, so it was 670 manuscript pages. So my agent said to me after I finished my first book, you know, you should write a shorter book. And I thought, okay, I will try. And I was going to only focus on those 10 years, and I did. But it, of course, like as I told you, it was caca. So <laughs> I, I just like figured I'm gonna write a really super short book. However, when I went to Japan, I realized that the characters that I was interested in the 70s and 80s, my character Solomon, I really thought the book was going to be just about Solomon and maybe his dad. <laughs> Rather, when I went to Japan, I realized Solomon and Moses make no sense without Sanja, who is the primary person who came when she was a 16-year-old girl to Japan. So I thought, if I have to write about Sanja and I want to write about Solomon, I guess I have to connect all the dots. And since I knew all the history anyway, that was the easy part because I'd already done all the research. But that's how it began, that I think that the Koreans in Japan do not make any sense unless you talk about the first people who touched ground. And for me, that was Sanja. So it was almost like history made me do this. It wasn't because I wanted to. And commercially, it was like a dumb decision. But what are you going to do? <laughs> Thanks, Mike. <laughs> now they all know. <laughs> Uh, yes, uh, in addition to uh, discrimination against Koreans, Japan is also noted for discrimination against women. Would you speak to that issue? Why not? Uh, <laughs> you know, it's funny, uh, Carol and I have a mutual friend, Kathy Mitsui, and she created this really cool term called Abinomics. And it's really important because her thesis, and I hope that I'm getting it right, is that the economy in Japan needs to really grow and the only way it's really going to grow is by taking half of its population, incredibly, incredibly competent women, and putting them out in the workforce. However, I will say that I'm not going to just rag on Japan here because South Korea also has this problem. And as a matter of fact, South Korea is very hostile to foreigners. So I'm the last person who's going to walk around saying, oh, you know, victims' rights, and isn't it terrible what the Japanese do to the Koreans? It's actually many nations, America is very special in this, is that we grant citizenship to people who are born on the terra, on the land, whereas most places around the world actually do it by blood, which is really scary if you think about the Holocaust. So uh, going back to your question about the way it treats women, um, it's incredibly difficult. I have many friends who are from Japan who are women, and once you have a child, or when you get married, you might be able to continue working, but once you have a child, you are required to do things for preschool and kindergarten, tasks that all of us would consider full-time jobs. And if you don't do them, you are shamed. Your kid is punished. So as a parent, I think that's incredibly cruel to do that to women. So I don't think, you know, I know that we have a working class stay-at-home mom, you know, debate in this country, but it's nothing compared to your kids not being included in parties <laughs> if, the, if your mom doesn't volunteer Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. So, I mean, just on a very practical level, I think that for me, daycare, childcare, um, universal health care, all those things really change the lives of women in such a dramatic way, and obviously children. Yeah, so, can you hear? Yes. Yeah, so I just Googled um, Korean Japan books. Yes. And the only book that I got was your book. 
and and since this has been going on for centuries, and particularly since 1910, I'm curious: are there one or two books that you recommend that have been written about this before your book? Oh no, there are many, many, many wonderful academic texts. No, I'm talking about novels. But in terms of novels no. and written in English, there are none. Oh. In, either in Korean or Japanese. Oh, I see. Well, the one that you can find in English is probably Yu Miri's Gold Rush. And she is a young Korean. Well, actually, she's not young. She's my age. <laughs> she was young when it was published. Because <laughs> I'm 49 in November. And it's, um, it's a very, very different kind of book. It's a wonderful, important book. However, it's you're only going to get a slice of the community because I don't think she was thinking about taking that on and I had no interest in taking it on it just sort of fell upon me so uh, I don't know it's Gold Rush by you Mary I think that some very thoughtful independent press probably translated and published it there's a young lady over here Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> um, have very many Korean, um, Japanese people emigrated to the United States or other countries, and have you met um, folks who are Korean um, background from Japan in the United States? What's your name? Jenny. Jenny. I like this question a lot because it's a really tricky question. Um, I and I, I enjoy a good problem, and it's interesting, particularly because. So many Korean Japanese don't say that they're Korean Japanese. So you might meet people who are, who say they're Japanese, but they're actually ethnically Korean. And the reason why they don't say it is because th the punishment socially is so intense. And I've actually met many Korean Japanese who've secretly like whispered it to me, like it's their secret shame that they're ethnically Korean. And of course, it's shocking for me because I, you know, I'm like, I'm Korean. <laughs> <laughs> aren't we fun um, and they don't think of it that way and they come here a lot of them if they have any money at all they actually will try to send their kids to the US because the US is really seen as this kind of promised land and one of my characters even very early on sees California as a place of you know equality and opportunity and liberty for people who are, despite their ethnicity and I guess even today, like when I was living in Tokyo, I would meet these really pretentious Americans, nobody here. <laughs> and I would be, you know, asked to go to parties that my husband was invited to and it was odd because I'd go to them and I would meet Americans who lived abroad and they had this attitude of like, oh, Americans, they're so stupid and fat and they eat too much sugar and they just like say all these things and I would literally have to like roll up my sleeves like, oh, we're going to have we're going to have to go down because <laughs> I feel this intense sense of loyalty and gratitude to America for the things that it has given me. And I think that I don't think putting down America as an American around the world in any way makes you more cosmopolitan or intellectual or gifted. So, and I would say this at a party that I was invited to. <laughs> so we weren't invited to that many parties. <laughs> yeah. No, I've had therapy. It's <laughs> so anyway, I hope that answered that question. <laughs> We talked a lot about the political aspects of your book, and it was eye-opening to me because I, I, like many people here, knew nothing about it. I read the book, however, and I want to sell the book. Oh, sorry. That's what this question is about. Thank you. My publisher thanks you. My mother thanks you. I read it as if it were a dirty pleasure. Oh, good. And um, <laughs> I was able to justify going off and saying, well, it's about this issue. But in fact, it's the characters who drew me into it. Oh, Can thank you. Can you talk a little bit about the actual novel parts of Pachenko and how you came to find those people and create them and make them so engaging? What's your name? Linda. Linda. Linda's question is really good. My publisher out there is clapping somewhere. Um, it's really important that I mention that my training ground and the reason why I really couldn't write the books that I wanted to write for such a long time is because I wanted to write a 19th century novel. And I wanted to write a 19th century novel with the crispness of the sentences of 
get this, this is my ambition. I wanted to write it as well as John Updike. I wanted to write sentences like Joan Didion, Annie Dillard. I mean, for me, like those are my heroes in terms of sentences. I mean, the way they, the way John Updike can use a comma, you know? But I wanted to have the narrative propulsion of a 19th century novel because I am asking you for a lot of time. So and when I'm saying I'm, gonna, I'm willing to write a book that's published 560 pages or 490 pages, which is Pachinko, I'm actually asking you, can I hang out with you for 25 hours or 24 hours? Oh, thank you. <laughs> Linda's so nice. <laughs> so going back to your question, which is that I wrote a 19th century novel with an American stylistic use of language. But I also wrote a very simple, very, very much like a 19th century novel. It's about a young girl. She falls in love with the wrong guy. She gets knocked up. She has to go to a different place. And then she marries somebody else who's kind to her. And she's got to make her way. I've been told that there's two kinds of stories. Somebody takes a trip or somebody comes to visit. This is one of those, somebody takes a trip. <laughs> Hi, this is um, off the mark a little bit. Um, uh, my husband and I were, t were, were a tourist in Japan where we had guides, and this is completely new to me, what you're talking about. So I'm very interested in reading your book. But I'd like you to comment, if it's possible. You know, we have a lot of intermarriage in this country. I think it's 17% of new marriages. Do any marriage, is there any, is there any intermarriage in Japan between Korean and Japanese? There's a ton of intermarriage, and as a matter of fact, I will say what's interesting about the immigration laws, and if you really are interested in immigration laws, there's an amazing book written by Aaron Chung, who's a law professor, I believe, at Johns Hopkins, and it's about immigration law specifically in Japan. And there's two things that you should know, is that marital status very often changes your citizenship status until recently. So for example, at one period in um, Japanese history, if a Japanese man, I mean, I'm sorry, if a Korean man married um, a Japanese woman, her children would not be considered Japanese citizens. And because the laws are so complicated, I don't want to like bore everybody here. However, if you wanted to know more about it, the immigration law is written beautifully by Aaron Chung. And the thing that I really want to say about Aaron Chung's book, which I think is so fantastic, and for those of you who don't read legal academic books, I do. <laughs> And I like them. And <laughs> uh, is that she talks about how so many of the civil rights that are gained in Japan for all foreigners, including white Americans, were actually fought for by Koreans in Japan. In the same way, I'm the beneficiary of many of the civil rights legislation that African Americans have fought for. So you have to actually give credit to the people who are willing to stand out there with a play card or boycott or complain. And because of this history of civil rights um, protest, again, Koreans are often seen as troublemakers. And I'll tell you this one silly story about a toilet. Um, my husband and I were staying at this really nice expatriate apartment that his company had paid for that I would not normally be able to afford. And one day, the toilet started to leak above our master bathroom. and. I called the management company and I said to them, oh, the toilet is leaking and they came and they fixed it and they had to open up the entire ceiling to fix this toilet. But then the next day they said that they're gonna come back and repair it. So then I said, oh, well, before you repair it, don't you have to dry it out properly? Otherwise you'll get black mold. And of course I've watched way too much 2020. So I was really scared <laughs> of black mold happening in Japan. Totally crazy, I get it. but. <laughs> Instead of, so then he said, and I said, I would stay an extra day from work for them to properly dry out the ceiling so then there'd be, the moisture would go away. And the Japanese management company said to me, you Koreans are always complaining. <laughs> and I was so shocked. I was so shocked because, you know, the model minority myth of Asian Americans in this country is that we never complain and that we're always like, you know, good at math and whatever. So. I, I, it was such a shock for me to think that someone would think that I'm complaining too much because I will literally pack up my boxes that I don't sell for the bookstore. <laughs> like I don't care about any of that stuff because I've done so many working class jobs when I come from a very um, humble background. And it was such a shock to me that someone can think that just because I was saying as a homeowner and not even it's not even my house 
so that was like one weird example of that happening. And that said, I, I really want to be fair to the Japanese because I have so many friends who are Japanese. My husband is half Japanese. My kid is a quarter Japanese. I'm the last person who would say that all Japanese people believe this. But what's so scary about stereotypes is that we can always rely on them whenever it's convenient. And that's what happened re re repeatedly for me. And that was really quite a shock. Thank you so much. Thank you.